But thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah Hawkinsmith. I'm the Outreach Director for the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science, also known as TIN. So today we're going to be talking about uh, birds of Lake Tahoe and the big year. And uh, Amanda, who is going to be co-hosting with me tonight, um, she's going to help read comments in the chat box, which will allow me to answer questions throughout the, the presentation. Today we're going to be talking about birds of Lake Tahoe and, um, and what a big year is to begin with and where you can find these birds and a little bit about each species that I go over. Okay, so before we get into the birds, um, the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science, we're a member supported nonprofit and we conduct research on local birds here in the Tahoe and Truckee region. And then we take that information that we learn in research and we share that with kids in the classroom, reaching over 6,000 students per year. And then we also provide other programs um, through outreach. So when we conduct research, we aren't just bird scientists, we conduct research on other animals like snowshoe hare, uh, Mount Lyle salamander, or primarily most of our research uh, really circulates around bird, birds. Um, and when we take that information that we learn about birds and we bring into the classroom, then these kids get place-based, hands-on learning experiences. So these kids get to come out and learn about Tahoe's nature with us via hands-on activities, they can actually come out and watch us um, conduct research. Oh, here's our, my boss, Dr. Will Richardson, with a, a gross beak, a female black-headed gross beak in his hand. And we're measuring the fat content of this bird and the kids come out and watch us actually collect that data. We have summer camps. I've started a local bird club at the elementary school. So we have a lot of, um, we give a lot of information to kids about birds. And regarding outreach, um, for this is for adults outside of the, the school context, we provide nature walks, uh, especially with the pandemic, we kind of slow a lot of those down, but we're just starting to pick up a lot of different opportunities. Um, so you can come out and look for wildflowers with us, come bird watching with us. We have opportunities year round, whether it's the Christmas bird count, but we have a lot of different things that we do. But a lot of people ask me a question, which is why would you bird watch in the first place? So I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people that have signed on are already interested in birds, but if you aren't, there's, here are uh, some, some reasons why to get into the hobby in the first place, okay? So number one is it gives you a better appreciation for nature. And when you go out and you start to learn about what surrounds you, especially near your home or where you're visiting, it will connect you in a, in a more significant way than if you just aren't paying attention to what's uh, surrounding you. Additionally, you'll, get, you'll become a lot more patient because birds are not on your schedule. You'll experience a lot of, when your reflexes just become a lot more in tune with the environment so you can just start seeing things a little bit better and you start paying attention to things that you probably wouldn't before. You're outside, you get to travel. It's just a really fun activity that um, is probably really important to a lot of people during this pandemic. And I've certainly traveled the world because of bird watching and that's been one of my main inspirations to go to different countries as well. So since I can't see um, the chat box, I might have to skip a couple of slides. However, if you're new to bird watching, here is how you can get started, okay? And then we'll get into birds here in a moment. The first thing that you'll need to become a better bird watcher or just start bird watching is you need a field guide, okay? Um, there's all different types of field guides that you can find online and in, in, in the library. Um, but the best field guide, in my opinion, in the Tahoe Truckee region would be Sibley's Bird Guide to the West. And it has this lazuli bunting on the cover because it's the second edition. The first edition has a varied thrush on the cover, but this, this one's a lot more up to date. Next, you'll want to get a pair of binoculars. Um, and when people ask me, what's the best binocular brand that I get or what should I buy? My answer is always get binoculars that try to spend as much as you can. Whatever's in your budget, spend that much, okay? So there's all different types of quality of binoculars. You can get binoculars for thousands of dollars. You can go on Amazon and get a couple, a, a pair for 50 bucks, but try to spend as much as you can. 
And when you are new to bird watching, it's best to get eight by 32, which is the strength of the binoculars and how they work. That's a good beginner to intermediate binocular um, measurement. But as you get better, you might want to have a, a stronger eye with more of narrow um, what you can see in your lens. And that would be like 10 by 40s or 10 by 42s. I always like to bring out a notepad and a pencil um, when I'm bird watching so that I can take notes. And then if I don't have all of my gear with me, then I can go back, email. You can always email me if you have any questions about birds here in the region. And we also, at the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science, we've created a bird checklist. We sell them for $2 plus shipping or you can download it for free on our website. And if you're interested in that, you can um, mention it in the chat box and I'll, and I'll get back to, back to you after the presentation. And lastly, something that can set you up for success with bird watching is there's, there are many different apps on your phone that can help you um, identify birds or identify calls or songs. And eBird is a great start. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, bird apps that you can uh, utilize, but I would, I would be sure to um, download eBird because not only does it help you with your bird watching, but you're also, every time you see a specific bird, it contributes to a large database of like where that bird is at what time of year, and that contributes overall to citizen science. So that's a good um, app to use. So when people also are newer to, to bird watching, it's not just identifying birds, it's understanding birds in general. So um, I do this at bird club every single time, every single semester or every single year, the kids come out for a bird watching club. I have them go over bird topography. And it's important to know the different parts of the bird. So uh, when you're looking in the field, you'll be able to identify these unique topographic parts and therefore we'll be able to identify the bird in your field guide because a lot of birds look very very similar. So um, typically when I have the chat box I'll ask um, people what each piece is but birding 101 you don't call a bird's mouth part a beak you call it a bill okay so if you want to be into the the bird lingo bill is is the best word to go by. So overall, this is the head, but on top of the head, we call that the crest or the crown. So when a, a bird's head is more circular or more rounded, you call the top of the head the crown. But when it's like a Stellar's jay or a blue jay and has more of like a mohawk, then you're going to call that a crest. So there's all these different parts of the bird that you should certainly learn. Um, and once you've learned all these basic parts, there's a ton more um, bird topographic part that you can learn as well. So um, there's always something to learn with bird watching, which makes it a really unique um, hobby to do. So this year we're putting on the Tahoe Big Year, which is how many species of birds that you can find in the Tahoe Truckee region in 2021. And you think, what? well, what's the significance of a big year? And for those that may have seen the the movie The Big Year with Jack Black and Steve Martin and Owen Wilson, I would be sure to watch that because it's not only funny, but it also kind of gives you a better idea what a big year is. But way back when, in 1785, um, there's this guy named John James Audubon, and he came from France to the U.S. Um, in search of something to do, a business to start or some sort of work that he wanted to be involved in. And he tried a lot of different business um, propositions, but nothing worked out. But the thing that did, or he was really good at, was drawing and, and illustrating birds. So here's a rosette spoonbill, here's an American advocate, here's an ivory-billed woodpecker, which is now extinct, and here are some passenger pigeons, which he also drew, which are also extinct. So at the time, bir birds weren't heavily um, sought after in terms of watching. Instead, people were out shooting birds all the time. But John James Audubon created these beautiful illustrations of birds which caught people's attention, okay? And so while people were starting to get interested in birding, there was also these days around Christmas day that they called the big day and people would go out and they'd see as many birds as they can shoot in a day 
and that would be this competition. Well, clearly that's not a good idea. Killing birds is never a good idea, especially now because it's illegal by many different acts like the Lacey Act or the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. But there was a club that was um, created in the 1900s and, or in the year 1900, and they said, why are we shooting birds? Let's just start watching birds. And because of that, they started and formed the first Christmas bird count which now is the longest standing citizen science count in the history of the United States. So um, it's turned from just kind of being interested in birds in American history to shooting lots of birds every Christmas to starting to watch birds throughout Christmas. And from there, there is a lot of different field guides that were put out and people just really started to become more interested in birding. So that's the history of bird watching and how um, people started to really track the numbers of birds that they would see. And now people do big years throughout the whole entire United States. So uh, the American Birding Asso Association, um, it's how many birds that somebody can see in a calendar year. And um, this, this gentleman, John, he saw 988 birds. So he saw a lot of different birds. I think it actually, this record has been broken in 2019, but I can't remember exactly how many species he saw. But then there's also world big year. So how many species of birds that an individual can count in a calendar year. And this Arjan guy from the Netherlands, he, he was able to identify 6,833 species. Okay. So the world's the limit with when it comes to bird watching, but us at the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science, we're just trying to have people bird locally here in Tahoe. So now we're gonna transition to the birds of Lake Tahoe and what we can find here. And we have about 317 different species. Um, there will be more as we add throughout the years, but that come to Tahoe. And that doesn't mean they steer, stay here year round. That means that they have been identified here in Tahoe at least one point in time. Um, out of that 317, 65, they're true Tahoe locals. They don't leave, they stay here year round. And that includes Stellar's Jays and Mountain Chickadees and so on. But most of the birds that do inhabit the region are mostly migratory. And there's different types of migrations, whether it's the winter migration where we see lots of eagles and waterfowl, or it's the summer migration where we are seeing lots of songbirds like um, warblers and sparrows and, and more colorful birds, but there's different migrations year round. We have quite a few summer nesters that come specifically to Tahoe and to, uh, and, and to uh, mountain habitats to have their young. And then they leave after um, after they're finished raising their, uh, raising their chicks. And here's a picture of a white-headed woodpecker, this picture taken at uh, Taylor Creek. So we're going to start off with birds of prey, the birds of prey that you can find here in the region. Um, and the reason why I've selected birds of prey to be the first bit of our presentation is because right now is raptor migration and waterfowl migration, okay? So we just had our bald eagle count. So here's an adult bald eagle, at least five years old. And we've done this bald eagle count since the seventies. And this year we had a significant increase in bald eagles that have come to Tahoe. So we've hovered around 24 to 25 in this count that we've been doing for decades. And this year we had 42 eagles spotted. So there definitely is, we're seeing an increase in raptors here in the region. So when people look at raptors, a lot of the time they can look a lot different than what you would expect them to look like, okay? So does anybody know what species of bird this is? And Amanda, if you can help me out, I can't see the chat box. But if you do know, please type it in the chat box and um, give me some answers of maybe what this bird is. Is anybody answering, Amanda? Someone says osprey, R-T-H. Okay, perfect. Oh, okay, R-T-H. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's fine. <laughs> so um, osprey is a really good guess because it has this white on its breast. But the person that put R-T-H, which is an abbreviation for red-tailed hawk, great job. 
So this here is a red a red tailed hawk, but this is a juvenile red tailed hawk. Okay, so birds look different from when they're young until they're an adult, and sometimes they'll look different depending on the morph, and I'll explain that as well. So here's a red tail hawk that's an adult, and it doesn't get a red tail it doesn't get a red tail until it's at least a year old. So red tails they don't have a red tail until they're a year. So up until that point, they have a lighter tail. So the red tail shouldn't be the most distinct characteristic when identifying it if you don't see that red tail. So here are two different morphs of red tail hawks. Um, there can be like rufous or dark morphs and there can be light morph red tail hawks. It's just kind of like how we have different hair color, okay? But the way that you can tell the differences between uh, red tail hawks and other hawks is I go by the dark light, dark light, okay? So we'll go back here. So darker head, light upper breast, dark, light. Next one. Darker head, light, dark, light. All right, so dark, light, dark, light. So when you start to see these patterns, you'll realize that it is a red tail hawk. Um, and that's the main way that I identify them is the, the patterns that you see on their overall body. So if you do see a red tail, clearly it's an adult red tail hawk, but they won't always have that. So here's another hawk that we have here in the region and it only really comes to Tahoe in the winter time. And this is a rough legged hawk. So it has fuzzy legs and they have a really light upper breast. Their head looks a lot smaller for a raptor. It kind of reminds me of an owl head. And they have these fuzzy feet with this dark, dark belly band. And in flight, rough, uh, rough leg hawks have these dark wrist patches, like two dark spots on their wrists um, as it starts to, to go into the very tips of their wing feathers. But these guys are, are still here in the region. And the best way, the best places you can find rough leg hawks and ferruginous hawks is if you go to Carson Valley or Sierra Valley, um, those are some great places to find them. We also have um, uh, red-shouldered hawks here in the region, uh, specifically in the winter time, but you can find them here in Tahoe year round. They have a very reddish breast and then their tail is striped black and white. So that's a good distinctive way to identify those uh, uh, red-shouldered hawks. Here's probably my favorite hawk that can inhabit Tahoe, but primarily you'll find them in Sierra and Carson Valleys. Here is our ferruginous hawk. So ferruginous means like rusty orange and um, you can find that rusty orange on their legs. But when I see these birds, they're typically mostly white on their, the front part of their body. And a lot of the times they'll be perched or sitting in the middle of like an agricultural field looking for mice. So that's where I typically see them. Um, one interesting characteristic about ferruginous hawks is that it has a very long gape so if you've ever seen Batman and Joker, um, it has a really, really long smile, um, what we call a gate. So if you can identify that, has a pretty large mouth. Again, uh, hawks can come in different morphs, and here's a dark morph ferruginous hawk, but I've never seen one of those ever here in the region. Um, here's a very common hawk that people can see year round and in all meadows or wetland parts of the region. Uh, this is uh, was known as the marsh hawk, but we call it a northern harrier. And a telltale sign for this, this bird is that it likes to fly very low across fields. So its behavior, you can detect what it is based on just how it flies. And in addition to that, it has this white rump. So um, this just this white spot right above its tail. And that's another sign that it is a Northern Harrier. And here is a male, an adult male Northern Harrier. It's gray where the female will be a little bit more brown. So males and females can look a little bit different too. We have peregrine falcon, falcons here in the region. They, they breed in Tahoe and we've been doing surveys on these peregrines for, um, I have specifically been doing them for the past five years, and there's finally, there's been a lot of successful um, uh, chicks because for a while we were having issues with hawk climbers impacting peregrine falcon nesting areas, and since we've put a little bit more regulation on that, peregrine falcons have been very successful in breeding here in, re in the region. Um, and actually here is a, this is a very 
poor picture of the scrape, but this was taken over half a mile or about a half a mile from the nest out of my scope. But you can see the little tiny peregrine falcon chick head and the mom going towards to feed it. So um, this is this is from last year's study. Some other hawks that you can see in the region include sharp shin hawk and, and Cooper's hawk. Both of these birds are under a category called occipiters, which means forest hawks that they like to fly in between trees and sometimes they'll live in the city and they'll fly in between buildings. They have really long tails to make them more aerodynamic and able to move a lot quicker and balance in the air. And they feed on actually other birds, kind of like peregrines. So they'll, they'll catch birds mid-flight and eat other birds. So they're pretty cool to find here too. And I would say, aside from red-tailed hawks, Cooper's hawks are probably the second most common hawk that I see here in the region. Our third species of occipiter that we see is um, a northern goshawk. So if you're if you've heard about conservation status or you know protections of certain animals, um, goshawks are a protected bird here, and they are well studied here in the region. And they're more of an overall gray with red eyes, and they're pretty neat too. And it's eating a, a pigeon on this stump, so that's pretty cool to see too. Hey, Sarah, real quick, um, I had a question pop yeah. up here. Um, so Tracy asks, uh, will sharp shin take on a great horn? That's a good question. Um, I don't think that my answer is a lot of smaller birds will harass and pick on larger birds. So if you ever seen, you know, blackbirds p picking at hawks flying or ravens flying, I wouldn't be surprised if a sharp shin hawk was just harassing um, a, a great horned owl, but it wouldn't be to eat it. It would just be to like upset it and scare it away from its territory. But good question. All right, and here's just a picture of a Cooper's hawk eating a, 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 a chipmunk. So they don't just eat um, birds that are flying, they'll also find things on land too. So does anybody in, in the chat box, does anybody know what this uh, bird is on the far left side um, of, the, of the screen? It's this darker brown. Any ideas in the chat box? Golden eagle, bald eagle good. juvenile. Perfect, cool. So right answer, very good. And it looks a lot like a golden eagle, but this is actually a first year bald eagle. So. Most people don't know that it takes five years for a bald eagle to get a fully white head and a fully white tail with the yellow bill and light eye. Um, when they're year one, they'll be mostly dark, dark eye, dark bill. And as they age from year one, two, three, and four, they'll have these different plumages um, per year. And then once they reach year five, then they'll turn into this American symbol bald. But here in the middle is also um, a phase of the bald eagle, year two-ish, three. So it can be speckled and spotted. So um, again, ages can determine different looks of birds as well. But here's a golden eagle. Um, if you look at a bald eagle, the bill on a bald eagle just looks like it doesn't fit its head. It just looks like it's way too big. For a golden eagle, it feels like it fits a little bit better on its, on its head. Also, golden eagles have a kind of like a goldenish brown nape, so behind its head, like near its neck. And um, golden eagle, the feathers go all the way down to its tarsi or its toes, where bald eagle feathers, it only goes, um, it's probably a couple inches or an inch uh, above where its toes start. Lastly, there's uh, obviously a few different patterns of you know, the, the bald eagle that we were talking about on the different phases that it has as it ages. And um, there's never going to be white in, this, in the areas on a juvenile bald eagle where it is on this golden eagle. And golden eagles, they spend a lot of their times by, time by rocky outcroppings and they're not really like birds to fly around like Lake Tahoe as a bald eagle would. So they're a lot harder to find unless you go by squaw or more rocky, outcroppings. And the reason why I showed this picture here of the bald eagle eating an American coot is because waterfowl, they migrate to Tahoe in the wintertime because they're coming from up north, 
there's more daylight hours down here than there are in Canada in the wintertime or Alaska. And Tahoe doesn't freeze. So a lot of times they'll congregate and live here for the winter and then travel back up north. And bald eagles like to eat waterfowl. Okay, so moving on to waterfowl. Something really important to remember is when you're looking at ducks, if you're a new birder, you want to look at behavior. So I'm, I'm explaining all these different physical characteristics that you see to identify these birds. But something that's very helpful is to watch behaviors and that will narrow down what birds you might be seeing, okay? So a diving duck will completely submerge itself underneath the water to find food, whether it's you know aquatic invertebrates or if it is um, plants or fish, they'll fully dive underneath the water. Whereas dabbling ducks, and I'll give examples in a moment, they just stick their bums up, their tails up in the air, and they just, they look for plants and they siphon and filter out plants through their adapted beaks and they don't fully submerge. However, they can, but they don't most of the time. So um, offshore, if you see a diving duck, you'll, you'll notice that its feet and its legs are way farther back towards its tail. Whereas a dabbling duck, the ones that stick their tails in the air, they have more of a centered leg in reference to their bodies. So diving ducks typically don't spend very much time at all outside of the water, whereas dabbling ducks will walk on land a little bit more uh, commonly. So here are some examples of dabbling ducks that we have in the region. And uh, right here is a wood duck and uh, probably one of the most beautiful ducks that we have. They like to hang out more so near ponds or like smaller bodies of water. Um, mallards is our most common uh, dabbling duck. Uh, here's a female mallard and here's our male mallard on the right hand side. When you look at all different types of ducks, the males and the females are going to look a lot different. But it's really important, especially for newer birdist, birders, to learn what the female mallard looks like. Um, it has this black line that kind of goes over its eye and has this, this orange feet, uh, a dark uh, blackish orange bill. So these things, is, it's really important to know. So then if you see something different, you'll know that it's not a mallard because a lot of female ducks can look very similar. Um, we have widgeon. So we have American widgeon and then we have our Eurasian widgeon, which is a lot less common here in the region, but you can find both. Uh, a lot more prevalent is the American widgeon with this white forehead. We have northern pintails, which is not super common in the region, but you can find them multiple times throughout the year. And the males have these really beautiful long uh, tails. Note, see this black bill, how it looks like a female mallard, but this has an all black bill and the tail looks a little bit different. So um, just start thinking about female ducks too, instead of just the beautiful male mating plumages. We have different types of teals. We have all three. We have our green wing teal up here in the foreground. And then in the background, we have our blue wing teal with this white mask. And then we have our cinnamon teal, which is this all cinnamon-y color. Um, all very beautiful ducks and do inhabit the region mostly here in the summertime. Now moving on to diving ducks, uh, our probably most common diving duck that we have is uh, the common merganser. So here in the, uh, in the front is a male common merganser, and in the background is the female common merganser. They look very different, but the female has like this beautiful crest, looks like a mohawk, probably looks like the male, but um, they are most common. We have hooded mergansers. I see a lot of these at Edgewood Golf Course or um, near Pullman Park in Tahoe City. I see these in the marinas a lot. We have both species of golden eye. So we have our common golden eye here, and then we have our barrows golden eye here. Uh, so notice, do you see this little dot here on the front of the face of the common? It's a circle. But if you go over to the barrows, it looks like more like a comma. That's one of the distinct ways that you can tell the difference. But also look at the scapular. So on the back where like the wings are, this is a lot darker and this is a lot lighter. Okay, so there's different there's differences in both, um, and it's good to know the common one. So then, if you see something different, you're like, "Oh, that's a barrow's golden eye." 
And I actually saw Barrow's Goldeneye in downtown Truckee walking across the bridge. So pretty rare bird to find the region, found it a couple weeks ago, just walking across the bridge in Truckee. Here's our buffle head. These guys like to be farther out in Lake Tahoe. I've seen many of these diving around and looking for little tiny fish. And um, they actually just started to, to breed here in the region over the past uh, few decades. So we're starting to see breeding buffle heads in Tahoe. Here's a ruddy duck. Um, there's the, he has a blue bill because this is the male and they also have like kind of poked up tails. Um, I think these are probably the coolest looking diving ducks. And the female has more of a striped face and she also has more of a pointed tail. You just can't see it in this picture. We also get scoters. So if you're familiar with bird watching, scoters are birds that are, they live mostly in the ocean. So if you were to go to Santa Cruz or Fort Bragg or like Monterey or something like that, you'd see most likely a scoter in the summertime, or if you took a boat out, you'd most likely see a scoter. But occasionally scoters will think Tahoe, oh, this looks like a small ocean. Let's just land here for a couple of days and they'll spend a little bit of time and then they'll realize, oh, this is really my habitat and they'll book it to the coast. Um, but every year we see a couple of different scoters that pop up in Tahoe and it's kind of a big deal and it's pretty neat to see. So you can see black scoters, surf scoters or white wing scoters here in the region. There's different waterfowl that are not a duck. Um, we have grebes like horn grebes and eared grebes. Um, they look pretty, pretty scary, but they're really beautiful at the same time. We also have coots. A lot of people think that coots are a duck and they're actually in the railier family. So like a Virginia rail would be its cousin. Um, and coots have this white bill, mostly black body and red eyes. But a way you can really differentiate a, a coot from a duck is look at its feet. They aren't webbed, they're, they're just lobed. And um, that kind of shows that it isn't in the duck family. Last, uh, one of our last water dwelling birds, we do get Jaegers here in the region. In German, Jaeger means hunter. And we have parasitic Jaegers and young, uh, long-tailed Jaegers that can occur here in the region. All three species have been seen. Um, and the best way to see a Jaeger is you see a bunch of gulls, like California gulls or ring-billed gulls, and they'll just start fluttering and just seeming very panicked. And um, that's because a lot of the times the Jaegers are just big bullies and they like to just charge at the gulls until they get so panicked that they throw up their food. And then they eat the regurgitated food from the gulls. So they're just bullies. They scare them into them, giving them the food that they've already eaten. So that's a, probably the best way to find a Jaeger in Tahoe. All right, moving on past the, the regurgitation. So um, we have a lot of smaller birds in the region. We have white-breasted nuthatch, which is very common. We have our pygmy nuthatch, which is also very common. And lastly, we have our red-breasted nuthatch, which is three of the most common birds that you can see in Tahoe year-round, okay? Um, since I had to switch, let me make sure I can use this as sound. Cool. So that's the vocalization of a red-breasted nuthatch. In my eyes, it's like rrr, 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 and that's basically the noise that it makes. Um, so it's all three of these birds stay here year round and they overwinter here in Tahoe. Um, and they like to crawl up and down trees and bounce up and down and they look for insects. So the behavior will very well help you identify these birds just going up and down bark. Um, and I see a lot of red-breasted nut hatches come to my feeder, as well as an occasional uh, pygmy nut hatch comes to my feeder as well. Other small birds include our famous mountain chickadee. The mountain chickadee is probably the top two most common birds that you can find in Tahoe. Um, the mountain chickadee is different from other chickadees in the US because it has a white eyebrow, also known as a supercilium is the scientific name for that part of the bird, but we can call it an eyebrow. People would understand that probably a little bit better. 
But our mountain chickadee, uh, they also stay here year round and uh, they make uh, beautiful vocalizations. Um, but most people know the sound of cheeseburger. So, so that's their mating call. They're saying, cheeseburger but that's the males just seem to find a mate but cheeseburger or mountain mountain chickadees um they make other vocalizations like this so um Chickadee dee dee dee. So when you're walking through the forest or going to ski or snowboard or snowshoe, you'll hear those vocalizations. And you can find a lot of different chickadees all over the lake, wherever you go. But they concentrate heavily at Chickadee Ridge, um, out by Mount Rose. You can go up and you can, you know, have some sunflower seeds in your hand and sometimes will even land on your hand, which is pretty cool. But just make sure if you decide to go up to Chickadee Ridge that you're using appropriate food source, nothing man-made and um, you're, you're aware that you're also feeding wildlife and wild animals. Some other question, Sarah? Yeah. Um, Daphne asks, if you can give advice on how to have a feeder when we have so many bears. Okay. <laughs> That's a good question. And if you've already had bears come to your feeder, it's a lot tougher. Um, because they know that it's there. So that's already a number one tough thing to do. I personally only feed really in the winter time because that's the time where the birds need it most. Um, so I only put up my bird feeders in the winter time. But I've seen um, people use ropes to tie their bird seed up very, very high in the trees. And that's a way to get them or protect them from bears. Um, additionally, putting up them up in the day and then taking them down before sunset is it takes a lot of work to have to go back and forth but um, it does work um, even though some bears will spend their time during the daytime looking for food too so typically if you've had issues with bears that doesn't mean you won't ever have them if you try these other techniques but at least try them before um, taking away your feeder so before I move on right now, this is really important. Probably the most important thing about my presentation is there's a salmonella outbreak out right now. So it started very, very heavily and strong in the Pacific Northwest up towards Canada, Washington, and Oregon. And then we've just recently seen a huge surge in salmonella issues in Reno and now South Lake. So if you have a bird feeder up right now and you're seeing finches, like pine siskins specifically are very vulnerable to salmonella, please take your feeders down for the month uh, because there's been, we, we just actually put this out in the paper last week and we've just been, we've been getting tons of phone calls over and over and over again, telling us, yeah, there's dead birds in my yard underneath my feeder and salmonella is contracted by a, a heavily visited place by birds and can be contracted through bird poo. And so if you do have a feeder out and you want to keep it out, you want to go through and um, clean your feeder every day and make sure that you're using the 10% bleach to liquid um, and just clean out your feeder. And th there are so many articles online of how to make sure that you aren't spreading salmonella through your feeders. So that's just my FYI right now. How about one more, Sarah? Yeah. So Rebecca asks, should we really be feeding birds at all? about that okay so that's a great question and it really just depends on your ethics but i just feel as long as you're not spreading disease and you're being very careful with your feeders we've done so as humans we've impacted bird habitat beyond any way that we can get back from that so all of the natural food source that our houses are built on top of what they can potentially eat or the, our, their migration pattern patterns they have such a rough go a little bit of boost during the winter time for you know making sure that they maintain those that fat level that they need i agree with it but this is just my opinion some other you know, scientists biologists naturalists they might disagree with that but my boss who is a phd scientist and has studied birds his whole career he also puts out feeders and just makes sure that he's doing it the right way and putting out the right feed so 
it really is an ethic debate and we don't have to get into that. But personally, for me, I think the extra boost is better for the birds. But um, moving on, unless Amanda, there's another question, but um, we're gonna move on to finches. And we have, so when birders come from outside of the area, they typically will come to Tahoe in search of owls, woodpeckers, and finches because they're prevalent here and we have some pretty rare ones here too. So we have 11 different species of finches here in the region. And some of my favorites I included in this presentation are uh, gray crown rosy finch, pine grosbeak, and red crossbill. So red crossbills are very unique. Their bills completely cross each other into like an X. And they're also one of the only birds that will be able to breed year round. Most birds only breed in the spring and summer, and then they're done. Um, their gonads shrivel up and they have to go uh, migrate or to do something different. The red crossbills, if there's enough food prevalence, they can have chicks year round. Our pine grosbeak speak is very, very beautiful. Um, actually, the illustration in front of our checklist that I told everyone about at the very beginning of the presentation, we have illustrations of pine grosbeak speak on the front. But some other types of birds that have these conical um, uh, stout bills. So it's easy to identify a finch because their, their, their bills are short they're big and they're triangular. Um, and some examples of birds like that as well is our black headed grosbeak, which might be one of my favorite birds in Tahoe because they're one of the first birds that start singing over and over and over again, and then they don't stop singing, but they just really share that summer's ahead and it's gonna be warm weather in the lake, you can go swimming soon and it's not freezing all the time. So the black headed grosbeak song is one of the things that reminds me of summer's about to happen. And then we have our evening gross beaks. Above is a female, below is a male. And um, they're also a type of uh, uh, finch that occur in the region. Blackbirds. All right, so we have um, a few different types of blackbirds that uh, inhabit the region. And we have, this is also one of my favorites. I feel like I have a lot of favorite birds, but um, Yellow-headed blackbirds you can find near marsh areas along cat. They like to hang and just like sail on cattails back and forth. Um, and they like to like bark this weird hiss when you walk by and they're just really silly little birds. But our yellow-headed uh, blackbirds um, inhabit the region in the spring and summer. And we have our red-winged blackbird. You can find year round, but typically they're a lot more prevalent in the summertime. Then we also have our brown-headed cowbird, which is if you're into birding and you know about them, a lot of people don't like brown-headed cowbirds. And that's because brown-headed cowbirds are weird and they do this naturally and they are native, even though they did, they're more like central United States, more Eastern United States, they've made their way West. But what cowbirds do is they, they don't raise their young. They, the females, they mate with the males and then they, once they're ready, they lay their egg in another bird's nest, like this little yellow warbler, which is more than half its size. And they lay that egg in the nest and then that warbler doesn't know it's a different egg and they incubate it and then they watch it hatch and then they feed the baby cowbird, which is a lot bigger than it is until that baby cowbird pushes out all the yellow warbler's babies and eats all the food and then goes on its merry way being a cowbird for the season. So they're parasitic nesters. They're basically like big bully birds and they're impacting warbler um, breeding results here on the West Coast. But um, I guess it's just like a birdie bird world out there, but people typically don't like brown headed cowbirds because they parasitize other, parasitize other um, species nests. But the reason why they do that to begin with is they typically in the past, they would follow buffalo or large ungulate migrations. And so they didn't have time to raise a nest and you know build a nest with their mate, lay eggs, incubate the eggs, raise the babies, fledge the babies. It just took too much time because their food source, what they would eat little insects off those bison, um, they didn't have time to do. So they've just genetically, and they've just learned a different way to raise young. Moving on, warblers. They can look pretty scraggly when fall comes along. But we have very beautiful bright colored warblers. They're just like the, the cherry on top when it comes to birding, especially in the summertime. We have Wilson's warblers, 
all yellow with a black cap. We have yellow warblers, all yellow with red streaky breasts, so bright. You can just see them just like jewels in willow, willow bushes. And they're just really beautiful. We have our McGillivray's warbler. I call them Mac attacks because if you push them or you like try to get them out of a bush by doing a bird watching vocalization, they just immediately come out and they're like, what's that sound? What's going on? They're very curious. Um, they have this broken white eye ring with a black uh, hood. We have our uh, Nashville warbler. We and so these all are birds. The top, the first four that I mentioned are very, very common. And then we have our American red start, which is a bird that's not found in California very often, but it does appear in Tahoe once or twice a year. And then we have our yellow rumped warbler. So um, for those big birders, we have um, this is a murdered, oh, sorry, a myrtle subspecies. So like. When it comes to birds, there's a species and sometimes there's subspecies where they divide that species into two uh, or more. And we have Audubon yellow rump warblers, which have a yellow throat. And then occasionally we get myrtle yellow rump warblers, which have a white throat. So they can breed with each other, but they just look a little bit different. Moving on to owls. Um, we have 11 different species of owls in the region, and uh, right about now, uh, if you live in Reno or Carson, it should be happening now, but soon you'll start to hear uh, um, vocalizations to attract a mate. So owls are one of the first birds to start breeding, um, and they'll breed early spring and late, uh, mid to late winter here in the region, so that starts to happen. Um, owls are really beautiful and interesting because not only are, is their flight very, very silent to catch prey because they have frayed flight feathers. So like the, the edges of their feathers are just rough looking, but it silences their flight. They can also rotate their head 270 degrees. So um, they can see all different directions. And the reason why they do that is because their eyeballs don't move like ours. Our eyeballs are actually round and they can move all different directions. However, Owl's eyes are more like binoculars. They're cylinder and they can't, they're fixed in their head and they can't move them. So that's why they have to move their head in all different directions. But what's really also neat about owls is that they have a blood pooling system. So like, so oxygen doesn't get cut off. If they turn their head significantly, then they'll have a system where they can keep blood and oxygen in their brain. Um, where we wouldn't be able to do that with our bodies. And that's why it wouldn't be good for us to turn our heads in, that, in those directions. So here is our smallest bird, which is a northern pygmy owl, um, the smallest bird in, uh, sorry, the smallest owl in Tahoe. It's probably as, as the size of my hand. And then we have our great horned owl, which is our largest owl in Tahoe. And they're very prevalent with their uh, large tufts or like ear looking feathers. And then another common owl that you can find are uh, northern sawwet owls. And if you are interested in buying bird boxes or bird homes, um, I've seen a lot of success. If you buy a northern sawwet owl box, they'll come to your yard and they'll nest in those boxes. So um, kind of a neat little uh, thing to, to add to your yard. Gray horned owls, uh, if, if you're interested in learning this, so, uh, the sound it makes. Here we go. It's not working, but you can also Google it, but it's just that hoot, that very general owl noise that you hear in movies. That's the sound that it makes and it should be making it now to find a mate. So then they can have these really cute puffy owlets that look like little white fuzzy balls. So they're pretty cute and um, they're all over the region. So we're hey, starting. Sarah, oh, sorry. Yes. Before you um, move on to sparrows, how about um, do you have any tips to see owls in South Lake Tahoe? Okay, good, good question. Um, owls are hard to find, but the best way to find owls in general, not just South Lake Tahoe, is owls are always harassed by other birds. So if you see Stellar's jays or just other birds just like making a bunch of racket and noises. Why are they doing that? They're probably harassing a larger bird. So, and that most likely might be an owl or a hawk. So the most, most of the time when I find owls, it's because other birds are harassing it. Another way to find owls is 
when you look on the ground, when you're on walks, look for owl pellets, the regurgitation of what they've eaten. And typically they'll come back to the same roost and feed there. Lastly, whitewash. So where the, bir the birds have typically gone the bathroom, <laughs> um, they like to kind of hang on the same roost all the time. So if you find like whitewash on a tree or like a building side, um, look, go to that place at night and you might be able to find an owl there. And then lastly, by listening to calls. Um, northern pygmy owl, northern sawwet owl, you can find those birds in the daytime. Um, it's also just a lot of luck. So that's, those are my best ways to give tips. All right, so um, we're moving on to sparrows. So sparrows are, sparrows and shorebirds are a lot of people's like birding kryptonite because a lot of them look the same. Um, I obviously will provide pictures of the birds that make it so they don't look the same, but they look the same and it's tough to identify. So this is where I really like to push people starting to learn birds by ear. So when I go bird watching, I typically I hear them before I see them. And that's a way that I can identify them. And also learning like, do these birds like to hang out on the ground? Or do these birds like to hang out in riparian habitat? Or are these birds higher up sparrows that like to be in more drier, dense chaparral areas? So it's good to know the natural history of birds that you're intending to find. So then you can um, identify them a little bit better because a lot of birds look the same. Okay, so here we have a song sparrow, um, which is our, one of our most common sparrows they can find. Um, they have like this streaky kind of crown, white supercilium, but a way that I like to tell this bird is because it has a dark spot in the very center of its upper breast. So that's a good way to find a song sparrow. Dark-eyed juncos um, are probably our most common other type of sparrow. Um, they're obviously very distinct and easy to find, and they hang out on the ground. And they actually nest in holes in the ground. So I've found a lot of those nests this summer doing research. Another bird is our, or another sparrow is our thick-billed fox sparrow, which is a lot larger than a song sparrow. And they have a lot of different song um, and they have a very large bill. So again, there's, I was talking about different subspecies. The subspecies of fo uh, fox sparrow that we primarily have in Tahoe is the thick-billed. But we'll also get um, a few others that might come by, but the typical one that you'll find is the thick billed fox sparrow. And they like to hang out on top of white thorn or sagebrush and they just sing on top and like to be the center of attention. And then we have our savanna sparrows. Note this like little like yellow piece near its lore. They like to hang out on the beach. Um, you can find them at Upper Truckee Marsh on the sand and they like to be hanging on the ground or lower in, 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 the, in the trees or in the bushes. So we have a lot of different sparrows. We don't have to get into those, but um, keep an eye out <laughs> and try to learn vocalizations. That will help you a lot. Moving on to vireos, we have two different species of vireo. We have warbling vireo and we have Cassin's vireo. Uh, warbling vireos are also one of the first birds that you'll just hear singing and singing and singing as spring turns into summer. So it's like, oh, it's a, a beautiful, transition in, uh, in, in timing of the year. And they don't stop singing, similar to the black-headed grosbeak that I pointed out. I don't have a call, but they go <laughs> so up, down, up, down, and they just continue to sing and sing. And um, right now, one of our research projects is we study warbling vireos, and I spent the whole summer looking at these nests. And they live in aspen habitat. They breed in aspen habitat. They need aspens, which is our, one of our only deciduous or leaf uh, leaf dropping trees in, in the region. But unfortunately, we have a non native moth called the white satin moth, and they eat aspen leaves. And they've come from Europe, and um, in their caterpillar stage or their larval stage, they just munch on leaves, just like a hungry caterpillar will. But they, this is the same bird in this picture as it is in this picture. So that little tiny nest doesn't have that camouflage coverage. So it's gonna be easily uh, found by predators and their babies and eggs will be consumed because of this non-native um, caterpillar. So that's one of the research projects that we've been dealing with up at Marlette Lake and all, you know, uh, Spooner, Spooner, the canyons over there and into Glenbrook. And it's all, it's a, it's a huge issue happening all throughout the United States 
So this is one of the things that we're researching right now. Uh, um, here's on a happier note, I had a warbling vireo nest. This is actually me with my binoculars, but a lot of them were at a lower height than what they normally nest at. Typically they're higher up in trees, but I had the chance to like look into the nests and um, count the, the chicks to see how well they were doing. And here's a cute picture of some warbling vireo chicks. Oh gosh, more sparrows. I forgot I had this slide. Um, basically, there's just a lot more sparrows. I know we're kind of running out of time now um, and I don't want to bore you guys with sparrows, but we have a lot of sparrows. We have four different types from the genus Zonotrichia um, and you can find all of them here in Tahoe. Primarily the most common one that you can find is the white crowned sparrows. So keep an eye out on those for those. Clark's Nutcracker is not a sparrow, it's in um, the, the Corvid family. I keep, when COVID first started, I kept calling it Corvid because it was just like stuck my brain as a birder, but um, it, it's in like the Raven and Jay and um, Magpie family. So they're all highly intelligent and Clark's Nutcrackers are the reason why we have white bark pines and that high elevation white pine tree because they, they spread the seeds um, and bury them and leave some of them because they forget and those trees grow. So they're really beneficial to our forest ecosystem, just as woodpeckers are. So we have pileated woodpeckers. I think we have not, it's either nine or 11 species. I can't remember off the top of my head, but we have quite a few woodpeckers because we have a lot of trees. Um, we have large pileateds, which are very, very big um, woodpeckers. And our second largest would be our Lewis's woodpecker which reminds me of a Christmas tree because it's red, white, and green. We have white-headed woodpeckers, um, which only really breed in the Sierra Nevada and up in the Cascades. So a lot of people from the East Coast want to come find this bird to add it to their list. We have black-backed woodpeckers, which are more of a rarer um, woodpecker. They like to inhabit areas of that were once burned, so old burned areas. And then we have a couple different types of sap suckers, but um, our most prevalent one that lives in aspen habitats alongside with those warbling vireos I was talking about is our red-breasted sap sucker. So um, I'll just dive into this real quick. Um, woodpeckers are amazing. I love them because they have all these amazing adaptations. And one of the adaptations that they have is they have very long tongues and their tongues will come out of their mouths and they'll feed on insects that are in trees. But when they retract the tongue back into their mouth, their tongue separates into two right here and it wraps around their whole entire head and goes through their nostril. Well, they do that because it helps them prevent themselves from brain damage because the amount of force that goes into drilling into a tree is more force than a jet taking off into space. So if they're hitting their heads really, really hard on those trees and with that protective tongue surrounding the brain, it doesn't cause brain damage as if it would with any other type of bird or animal. So pretty cool natural history facts. Here's a northern flicker, which is our one of our most common woodpeckers that we have. And a lot of people will send me feathers that are bright orange and they'll be like, what feather did this belong to? It's a northern flicker. They have bright orange under wings and bright orange under under tails. All right. So this is one of our last few slides. Birds that are blue. So Blue, it's interesting because the color blue is not actually a pigment in birds, like red, for example, or pink, um, I'll actually show you. So on a Western tanager, which is the last slide, it has a bright red face. And the more that this male Western tanager eats, the brighter red of, of a face it will get, okay? And um, it's called a carotenoid pigment. It's absorbed through their food source, but with, with, blue types of birds, um, they're, it's like, it's a, it's a illusion. So how the sun hits the feathers and the spongy layers of the feathers projects a bluish color. But if you were to take like this Stellar's Jays blue feather and you took a light and you put it behind it, it'd actually be like a brownish color. So it's actually not blue. It's not a pigment that's um, produced in that bird. But a couple different birds that are blue that live in Tahoe, Number one, it's called a Stellar's Jay. It's not a, called a Blue Jay. So if you can remember anything from this presentation, it's called a Stellar's Jay. Um, we also have Western Bluebirds and Mountain Bluebirds. Western has this like orangish breast, breast and Mountain Bluebirds are all blue. 
And then lastly, we have our lazuli bunting, which is um, a really beautiful bird. And I've seen a lot of these in South Lake Tahoe in the Angora burn area, okay? And of course, back to our Western tanager, probably the coolest bird that we have in Tahoe, migrates from South and Central America, comes up, has its babies in Tahoe, and then migrates down. But there's just such beautiful birds a lot of people get into birding because they'll see this bird out in the middle of like a Jeffrey pine tree and say like, did somebody's bird escape from the cage? Because it's so bright and beautiful. And then they'll be interested in that bird and then they might get into birding. So it's an aha bird or a first bird for people to really start recognizing birds in the region. So this is the last few slides of our presentation. Thanks so much for coming out with us. But um, a couple of things to, to remember is if you are interested in birding or if you're intermediate and you want to become a better birder, continue or start paying attention because that will just elevate your birding um, expertise by a lot. Okay, so just start going outside, listening, look for movement, and you'll be able to find those birds. And then learn the common birds. So learn the, you know, the song sparrow and the female mallard and the American robin and start to learn vocalizations like the American robin, okay? Start making checklists. Start noticing behaviors. For example, uh, uh, fly catchers, they like to sit on top of a tree, go catch a bug and come back. Go catch a bug and come back. So you'll know, oh, that's a, that's a fly catcher behavior. And therefore I can go to the fly, fet, fly catcher section of my field guide. Um, write down notes. Sometimes it's better to write and then you'll remember it a little bit better than just like, oh, somebody told me this or I read it. It's good to write down what you see. Use your ears. Really get acquainted with your field guide. Like know which bird belongs in which section. Like know that hummingbirds and woodpeckers are in the middle of a field guide and ducks and geese are in the very beginning and finches are the last um, uh, are typically the last bird in the field guide. So like, learn your field guide so you can easily get to that page. And then come out with me or come out with, you know, your local guides here at the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science. And we will point out a lot of birds for you and find them for you and explain how we have found them to begin with. So if you're listening to birds and you're trying to get into more vocalizations, start with the robin because a lot of birds sound like the robin and then you can go from there. Birds not, not only have songs, but they have calls and other vocalizations too. But if you took that robin call and you made it fast, you sped it up a little bit, it sounds exactly like a black-headed grosbeak. If you took that robin song and you made it like it had a sore throat, it sounds a lot like a western tanager. Okay, so if you learn the robin song, you'll learn other different songs here in the region too. Um, I put this hermit thrush because it's my favorite bird. I know I've said one of my favorite birds earlier in this presentation, but my favorite bird of all time is a hermit thrush because their song is so beautiful. So I encourage you guys to listen for them out in, in Tahoe. They're all over Alaska, Santa Cruz, but um, be sure to keep your ears open for those guys or, or listen to their call after this presentation. So we have so many different opportunities to be involved with the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science. We are, um, we are a nonprofit. We have been hit very hard by this pandemic. We're working solely virtually when typically we are in, in the field, leading bird tours, teaching kids, getting people outside, exploring nature. And we've been stuck primarily indoors. So it's been a huge hit on our organization, but we are still thriving. We're still figuring out how we can reach people and how we can engage people in nature. And one of those ways is in, is coming out and doing the big year with us. So our Tahoe Big Year, you can access it through tahoebigyear.org. Create an account. We are sponsored by Patagonia. So every month we'll, we'll just draw randomly. If you're participating in our in, in the Tahoe Big Year and just finding birds and putting them in the website, you can win a puffy or a duffel bag or something from Patagonia. So please, please participate. You could win a prize. Um, you could come out and join us for an outing. We're just starting to do outings, um, more caravan style outings where we go in the car and we pull over and we have walkie talkies for everyone. So it's a way that we've adapted to the pandemic. Um, you can also donate. So, you know, everyone wants to give their spiel. I really stand for this organization that I work for. I moved 
um, I, I was working in environmental planning and I just knew that this is something that was really important for the region and that the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science is doing a lot of good and um, really reaching people and connecting them to science and nature. So if there's any way that you can give, whether it's spreading the word, becoming a member for $35 a year or giving larger donations, every dollar is appreciated. We have three staff that reach over 6,000 kids a year and we banned thousands of birds as well. So research, education, and outreach is all a large component of what we do with, at TENS and any way that you can help out would be great. And if that's not in your wheelhouse at the moment because everyone is having, is struggling during this pandemic, if you just come out and bird and bird watch and just have that enjoyment with birding, that's also giving back to us as well and giving back to yourself. So that being said, Amanda, I'm, finished with um, with my presentation. And if you have anything else to say, um, please do so. Well, there's one more question um, or comment from yes. Scott. He asked, or he's hoping you could tell us about strikes. Oh, okay, yeah. So we have, yeah, no, and if anybody needs to leave, feel free, but I'll answer any questions. Sorry, I forgot to, to mention that, but I'll answer any questions and now I can actually see the chat box. Um, but we have Northern Shrike and we have Loggerhead Shrike. So we get a couple different loggerheads throughout the year, but just recently we've had multiple, multiple sightings of Northern Shrike in South Lake. So if you go to the Upper Truckee Marsh, or you go to Lighthouse Shores next to the Tahoe Keys, there's been a Northern Shrike hanging out there. And if you know anything about Northern Shrikes or, or Shrikes in general, they're a bird of prey. And what they like to do is they'll catch like a little lizard or a little mouse or another bird and they impale them. So like they'll take that, that food source that they just got or found and they'll stick it onto a sharp stick or barbed wire and they'll just like, it's pretty like morbid, but it's also kind of a cool way that a bird's using a tool to be able to, to kill their prey or save their prey for later. Okay, everyone, um, thank you so much for joining, joining us. Um, we're gonna go ahead and stop the presentation now. Um, and Sarah, we'll see you again. Yeah, thank you so much, Amanda. Have a good night. See you guys, good night.